so I, I, I repeat uh, just what was the beginning I had a new picture uh, because probability theory started from that, not from science. And uh, then all these pictures, I just I will reach on to some of them. And uh, for, for us, the more pronounced will be the, uh, relevant with the first one when we have this uh, membrane in the cell, how they're made out of molecules. And this mathematical model of that fully non existent and much has much more dimensions and st mathematical structure than the plateau problem, what you do in variational calculus. And the second, and the, and the one with uh, this. Mm -hmm. Okay, on, on Doc Rigardesi. Some you, some you, Papa Femme, some you. Okay, well, it's visible the crowd, tell you. And, uh, the, the, and here, this one is a Morse function properly interpreted, and we shall see relation between the two, yeah? How they related. Then, how, how, for example, this picture is Morse function. This is one of the way I look at the problem of, perca of, of protein folding, percolation aspect of the, of, of the, Protein folding, we say that to the rest because I will not probably return to that. That proteins are molecules that undergo some process from one state to another. They, the, the molecules take some particular shape. Where my understanding crucially depends on dimension three, it wouldn't work on dimension two or four. Right? They move and they touch each other themselves, and the organization with touching point allows them to fold in a particular way, pre predicted programmed in the sequence. So it's kind of a remarkable thing when this information and materialization of these information are assigned to the same object. But so what is, but this process depends on the properties of the media, the, uh, the arts, in particular temperature or, or pH, whatever, when you change it, this is a more function, you change it. And at the, at the minimum, you need the space to be connected. You have to be the, the point you want to reach is folded, must be reachable. So it's a different model of percolation, somewhat unusual, where instead of considering a sub random subset, you have a random function, and you look at the sub level of this function depending how you move it. And so this is a kind of percolation become characteristic of what happens well in, 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 in other kind of physical, physical problems. Yeah, All kind of when you have energy, and you see what happens with energy, free energy, how it changes. And how that is a critical phenomena. And, and protein folding is kind of of this nature. Yeah. If temperature is high, you know, body will go like that. You have one chaotic state, and go down, you, 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 you go to fold, folded state, and there are some intermediate states. Certainly, it's much more uh, co co again, complicated than physical, physical problems. and cannot be studied, I think, analytically, so to speak, but still conceptually, it is worth understanding. Yeah. Of course, you cannot solve it in practice without computer, pop, computer assistance. Then, read this. Yeah, this ah, again, I, I add a picture. Just, oh, yeah. This is a history of probability theory starting from Bernoulli. For us now, from Bernoulli. Then the next. In, Again, my knowledge of history is superficial. Maybe I'm missing some important kind of important uh, important steps. Yeah, if you take three three steps in probability in, in, uh, as related to the real world, first was the law of large numbers, more or less predicted, conjectured by Cardano and proved by Bernoulli, and was a difficult theorem. Though nowadays, you know, it more or less follows from Pythagorean theorem, as m most of geometric theorem, you know. And from Pythagorean theorem, of course, and then there was this point made by, but I know if, if Buffon was the, the first to make this point of continuous probability and related it to what we now call Haar measure, interval geometry, in, the, on, on, in this case in the circle, when you throw a needle and see probability to his line, and actually you know, he was making experiments of this kind with baguette, okay, according to history. I don't know if this kind of baguette were already in Bernoulli time, or in, in, in Buffon time, yeah. 
I, I, I don't know in our, in, our, in our bakery history, yeah? but this is what's said. And the last is this Ingrid House kind of phenomenon, usually associated wrongly with the name of Brown. And, and, and again, you know, this fantastic logic, because of course Brownian motion, we assume and just pushing that with the force, Brown would invent it, discover Brownian motion. Yeah. This, you can see a great thesis saying that. Everybody has an old belt, because Brownian, Brown doesn't mean color, Brownian mean name, which is, of course, Brown was just one, one of the people involved into that, but not the first, not the last. And the, and the first was probably Tito Lucretius, who observed mo moving of the dot uh, of dust in the air, uh, in, uh, thinking it was Brownian motion, though what he says is not absurd anyway. Even convection, convection come after all because of the motion of individual molecules. And it is again highly non-trivial mathematic, mathematic explaining how from motion of particle of, of of dust in the, in, in the air, which is a bunch of particles of, of atoms, this notion appears. And then there were various things, and one of the, in, in the recent time, was remarkable Paul Flory, who made two fundamental contributions. He first he introduced and studied and made fundamental stuff about self-avoiding random walk, which is called Gauss self-avoiding random walk, and produces very interesting models which more or less neglected by mathematicians because they're too kind of, well, they're not so primitive as the one we study. And, uh, and, uh, and then also the percolation. He, 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 he studied percolation under the name of gelation and also computed, which I, 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 as I said, I haven't read carefully his paper, whether his computation was on the basis of some natural, so-called physical, Conjectures, usually physical conjectures, even the greatest people are just non-rigorous mathematical conjectures. There is no physical intuition is a sticky point. Yeah, in physical, in physical, there are facts, you, you know them. And interpretation, in, in, intuition is mathematics. There is no, so, so to speak, physical intuition, except the one which is now a body, which is certainly doesn't correspond to the real world. Yeah. And um, so there was this two big step. And then they have, of course, mathematician took over and yeah, proved some theorems very far, so I want to emphasize this, fantastically simple, annoying problem that we don't know if, if a random embedded curve in the space, in whichever model, spreads more, spreads less, that if there is no constraint of being not embedded, if you allow self-intersections. And of course, it will even become longer, but there is no proof of that. And it's an, 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 you know, if you see what's proven in this regard, it's just, you know, kindergarten. Yes, absolutely no idea what to do. And it's not surprising, in a way, because the space of embedded lines, such curves or circles in space, it's very, very complicated. My, 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 my first picture, exp, exp, I, I, I return to my first picture. Yeah, this is in blue on the bottom. This is the space. This is kind of, if you try to imagine, what are the structure of the space of embedded lines? So you can see the, all this line, the kind of if you like, discretize it, high dimensional Euclidean space, and you throw away diagonals. All things when they interact with neighborhoods of diagonal. In this tremendously complicated kind of space, you throw away the infinite amount of it, and it's just all this kind of labyrinth. And there is a measure which you say, huh, now we take a uniform measure there, and there is a justification why it will uh, uniform measure. So if you use Monte Carlo methods or whatever that uh, converts naturally to this measure, still it's, a, it's not 100% clear. You want to know how such thing looks like, and you even don't know if the question makes sense, right? Because when you say it looks like, you expect that typical thing, they all lo look the same. So there is a bulk of configuration which all look the same. And this is true in a huge number of instances, which is now it goes back to Bernoulli theorem, and then in geometric term brought into Levy, and now it's called concentration phenomenon, and there is no idea if it's, uh, some people call it statistics uh, in physics, and, and it may, may or may not be here. It's unknown. So, in, in uh, self avoiding random walk. And this gives you an idea of the best of the complexity of the problem. Then there was this. Um, uh, 
Mendel, Boltzmann, et cetera. So you just go through that, a huge, of course, huge, huge, of the, make a huge lapse in, our, in mathematics, I, I repeat. Not in, there was a certain people doing science, but in simultaneously we're discovering new mathematics. Oh, and often it, it was not accepted by contemporaries because it was new mathematics. They were not bound, they didn't learn enough contemporary mathematics and saying in the language which was not corresponding to mathematics of that time, and people were considered uh, unrigorous, as was the case in Boltzmann. And the poor actually was mistreated. He was mistreated by mathematicians who saying, well, it's not rigorous, and by theists who saying, well, just mathematics, it's not physics. So we don't, get, uh, don't care what you do. So he was a real unhappy man. But I don't think it was the reason he finally committed suicide. It's usually not, not enough to be in something, something chemical in your brain. So. Now I want to, another example where probability should work and it doesn't so easily is, uh, is okay, I have to do it here because it's, maybe I have to do it like that. Uh -huh. It's more efficient. Yeah. yeah, so Maxwell was one of the originators of statistical mechanics. But, and then, but then there was, and still there is, much activity of studying languages probabilistically. And Chomsky was one who was very much against it, and he is still very much against it. And he was quite justified in saying that traditional probability is not good enough. And the reason is, is here, because individual sentence, uh, typically long enough string, appears only once, and so what is probability? So I, I don't know what probability actually means, but its frequency of that makes no sense. However, what does make sense, and if you start looking at the Google, that immediately if you, yeah, but then again, what I say is also the same true, of course, about physics, individual state of a configuration of, of, of particle has even less meaning. Uh, Right, we have the, uh, this prob probability of the having all particles on the left or on the right in the, in the, in the bottle. So this, this number, well, it's just a number. Yeah, in, in physics, we don't know if this not, the number certainly makes no sense at all. However, and this is kind of a remarkable thing, equality of these two numbers is okay. Because at this moment, we go to mathematics, numbers are not there. It may be nothing compared to that, but equality does make sense, no matter how we divide divide your uh, space into halves, these two numbers are equal, which is of course is not true again because the number of particles variable and this number changes and so I have huge exponential uh, jump, but if you look at the next ratio and the next ratio and take log, there are some numbers you can produce which do make sense and this we actually measure, in a second we discuss what we actually measure, and, and, but it's very convenient to have these numbers defined and be equal, right? So. And uh, but of course, it's a big conceptual physical problem. What, uh, what actually we measure, as you know, in the quantum, quantum mechanics, of course, you know, measure and become a very tricky point. Right? We don't know what we measure. And, uh, and, and, and this is just so, so, so what what's partly replaces probability in linguistics. There are trees. Each string, correct, each frequency or probability is not a number, but a tree. And trees, you can think a little bit, they make kind of nice structure. You can add trees, multiply trees, it's kind of a nice category. When well organized, where the sp sp probability are special trees with just segments. The trees with the length of edges, which is secondary or secondary importance, but this combinatorics is more, more pronounced. Here, these two trees, the two words or two strings, very different in their frequency because the trees have very different patterns of branching. And this what part of the what have to go to probability of in the language and also in, in, in molecular evolution. When I say evolution, molecular evolution, everything else is just, just words. And, and molecular evolution is evolution thing. And, and then there are some examples which I discuss briefly. If you have a sentence and this package doesn't fit into my, into my sack because it's too big or because it's too small. 
if this it is presented as its pronoun, what is the noun corresponding to it? And this was Vinograd challenge saying, well, it's just very difficult by, for, 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 for artificial system to decide it, yeah, because it's not, it goes from semantic, it doesn't cover by, 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 by syntaxes of the sentence. However, with Google, it's pretty easily you can do it, except you may be very easily deceived because, as I mentioned last time, on the Google, cats eat grass. Cats don't eat, don't eat uh, mice, or pigs fly much more frequently than, for example, pigeons. There's more pigs flying on the internet than flying pigeons. But if you look at the numbers, but look at the trees, you immediately see the difference. Yeah. If you we have this petite trees point, you see that pigeons do fly, and and it's not not as true about pigs. But this tree is only approximation. It's just one of the bottom invariants. Yeah, it's not the the full invariant. The full invariant is kind of well harder to say what it is, and it's certainly because it's not mathematics, it never goes to end. So this is a quite interesting. And so, yeah, and this is the last question to you. So how we assign significance to some event, for example, in the language, and also in biology, in biology, which is which is not in physics. Imagine you have such a sequence of numbers. Oh, I'm sorry. And you can see there's just three, three lines of zero and ones coming from from space. Do you think it's random or not? So do you? And in this, this particular di dyadic, dyadic pi. But you have to know something. So, and the point is that probability becomes B functor. It depends on what goes and who receives it. And this is, of course, like that. And, and this becomes more interesting. So you have to pro probability in linguistic, probability in biology. So for example, if particularly chemical will be interacting with the organism. Yeah. And, and this problem all the time, there is pharmacology, yeah, one of the fundamental issues when you invent new drug, before you start making experiments, which certainly is the most expensive, product. but not actually now, now computer simulation also expensive, but it's probably the most expensive experiments, you have to decide many properties of the drug, one of them, if it is poisonous or not, and how to look at the molecule, get it. And so what probability of a molecule being poisonous, it depends, of course, poisonous for whom. As you know, so for example, avocado, is deadly for most animals. Yeah. Only peop I think only pigs and people can eat it. We are, of course, relatives yeah, you know, in our eating habits, as we all know. Yeah. Eating like pigs, yeah, you know, you never see, see people eating like camel. Right? Who, who people can eat like camel? Yeah? <laughs> this is why with pigs we have this fighting for, 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 for this. Now, so now we just, where a uh, simple mathematics works, with a prob probability type, and this is, I just want to look at the one particular, to, to say two words about one story concerning entropy, because I thought about this for a while. And, and this is a Shannon entropy, and, and this is just a very good example when you take a very kind of simple physical, so, so to ca kind of uh, contrary to what I was saying, not physical, but common sense intuition, and, and how you turn it to mathematics. And I just say it's very simple but not obvious, right? And that's my experience. I was just trying to do this about, almost about 10 years ago. And I thought, just do this also to biological system and start with entropy as a warming up. And it took me uh, two or three months or so where I stopped with my article. And I still couldn't do it. But still, just look at this. So what, is, what, 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 what this means? Yeah, just look at the picture, the additivity. So we have some system, in particular it may be a bunch of particles, and, uh, and, and, and some particle may be light or not light, and you see them, yeah? So actually, one must be realized when we observe a system, you don't see things, you see events, right? You only can see something when something changes. If something doesn't change, you don't see it, right? You know, in quantum mechanics, you know, we have to they change, and there was a photon coming, and this is all you see, yeah? No, no, well, nowadays, maybe you, see, you can see gravitational stuff, but Still not directly. So you see photons. So you have observed one, you observe two, and observe one, two. And we, we want to say this entropy of one, two cannot exceed the sum of these two. And, 
And then you postulate, you, I, I, oh, I don't know, the word postulate maybe not right for the thesis, but what is the entropy? And you use the kind of this sentence, which you can take from some textbooks in physics. Entropy is the log of the number of states. Whatever it means. And then, of course, it's kind of clear, or more, more precisely, the number of effectively observable states. Because there are many hidden states you cannot see which have no effect on what you are doing, right? But only those which are observable states. And then if you make two different observations and bring them together, that if they don't interact, what you see here and what you see here, you can see them independently, this or this. Or if they interact, you see less because knowing one, you know something about another. And therefore, you have this formula. The question is how to mathematically make mathematical sense out of that. So people say, okay, mathematics, write a formula. Entropy is some minus some pi log pi. Ta ta ta, write a formula log convex, so we've proven it. And take this, uh, this for definition, which is, in um, my view, completely nonsense, because it's a computational formula. Actually, it was not introduced by Boisman, but by, by Max Planck. And Boisman used, of course, this kind of com computations, but I did, he had this one, how to make sense out of the, what I said, and prove it in this exact, how to turn this into argument, making log convex not. And actually, if you, this property implies convexity of log, right? In fact, it can log convexity of log, or x log x, whatever you can, k, which follows from that. And the next level, when you have three events, and then there is a more elabor elaborate formula, for the entropies, mixed formula. And then, yes, uh, from, 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 the ge from geometric perspective, what's interesting, this formula implies what is kind of a powerful geometric inequality, which I wrote then, just yes, I want to say it's a special case. When you have, yes, a, a three-dimensional body, you project it into planes, and then the volume of the body bounded by areas of these planes by but their product, but their product and the power uh, 3 over 2 or 2 over 3. Yeah? And this is, in a way, more profound than asymptomatic inequality. It's not sharp, in a way, it's extremal, of course, will be rectangular solids, but not balls. But it's better, it corresponds to what is called logarithmic Sobolev inequality. Of course, the constant is not, sh not sharp one. Actually, I'm not certain that logarithmic, the, the corresponding form, is proven in equivariant form. I still think it's open. Of course, Sobolev inequality is proven, this logarithmic Sobolev. But this is a better, this is stronger than logarithmic Sobolev inequality, actually. If, if you, so, so in some examples, this is give you constraints when those inequalities don't. And then, just to understand how primitive it is, here is a version of pure linear algebra. And you can say, it. so this asymptotic inequality, this ball, or, or, or roughly any, any domain, is volume bounded in an effective way by the uh, area of the boundary. And then there is this very kind of stupid linear algebraic inequality, which is stronger than that, which implies what I said, and is even more general. And so it says that there is a next level to that. And this next level roughly corresponds to going to probabilities. Right, that almost very many things in this world have probabilistic interpretation. And this is, and, and then they become more generally have more flexibility. In a second, I give an, another version of that. But, but this is, I want to relate to my picture at the very beginning of um, this, uh, this top picture, when you have membrane and membrane out of molecules, and this molecule assemble in this form assembled to this form because of the part of the statistical ensemble of this particle and water surrounding them, from where this picture emerges. And in particular, they make this extremal shape, for example, balls, exactly because it solves an isopermetic problem. But I don't think we have a proof of this. Of the, and we know entropy kind of brings it over there. Yeah, there is an entropic argument over that, like this uh, Shannon inequality. But still, there is, of course, no proof of that in, in these terms. In another particular instance, when a pretty certain mathematical equation uh, is unsolved, I don't have this picture, unfortunately, I forgot to bring it, is the shape of a, it is a, mm. if 
heel veel bladcels. Ja, they look like that. Yeah. The rotation is symmetric form of this biconcave form, yeah, erythrocytes. And uh, it is a mathematical question to prove they are like that. And again, the people who work on that, biologists, they believe they understand it because I think they assume rotation is symmetric and then you can solve ODE and now they will have this kind of form. But why the rotation is symmetric and what corresponds in, to these two high dimensions is easier to form, you can formulate corresponding PD or geometric problems, variational problems, and, uh, and this is unknown. And of course, you, and, and what you want, solution you would, would rather have, not just using this PD, or like in the case of a sphere, which also is extremal surface has constant mean curvature, and you know constant mean curvature implies spherical, which is Alexander's theorem, which is not trivial, using maximum principle. There is no corresponding purely probabilistic argument, using ensembles and just... All, all the point, yes, ex this example with Lumi Suitin suggests that whenever we have some inequality with numbers, with probabilities, there is next level. From sets you can go to linear algebra. And this, now, and how you prove this, uh, this inequality of, of Shannon or this uh, Lumi Suitin, whatever, in this, in this physical language? How you can interpret entropy as the number of states? And this you can do using Bernoulli's theorem. That's exactly, I believe, how people like Boisman thought about that. So when you observe something, you have this, uh, where this pi log pi. They're frequencies of certain events. Uh, but now what you can do, if you repeat experiment, experiments many times, you observe that some events which appear uh, with sharp separation by Bernoulli's theorem, some events will be coming all the time with probability close to one, the only one you will be observing. And some of them will be negligibly small probability. With the law of large numbers, you converge to the, to the mean, whatever this mean is. But now when you repeat experiments, you take a product of spaces, so it's multiplicative Bernoulli theorem. But of course the same. Additive group and multiplicative group are the same. And then this come, things come. And this can be formulated in a kind of nice categorical language. If you think about this finite probability space on category in obvious sense, and then you take growth index semi-group of this category, keeping in mind it's continuous, and then you see that entropy is just the value of, of this and this multiplicative group, or you take log of this when you go to additive group. And then entropy comes refunctorial, and I think it's really a number of states ex if experiments repeated many times. And then all properties, yes, <laughs> now you can see everything good physicists say has very simple meaning if, if one set can contain another set, it has smaller, smaller cardinality. And that's all about entropy. And, and, lo, and, and convexity of log follows from that, interestingly enough, because you can interpret it exactly in the same way, right? How, how things emerge. So, 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 so this is the, the point. But now, I think at this moment we change, change our attitude. Ah, yeah, no, no, I, I, another word I want to say. And then well, another more traditional way is mm. for Neumann entropy, when you have a, your state is a self-adjoint operator in a Hilbert, in face, finite dimension, physically Hilbert space, and it says trace one, and it say and and it's po po positive, yeah. So it's like pi. It's this, this eigenvalue, so this like probabilities, and you can make entropy. And then, again, entropy has the same properties. If you observe system partially, this entropy is sub-additive, and even it's strongly sub-additive. And this has interesting history. It was conjectured about 50 years. It was proven for absolute case. So let me... Yeah. It was a proof which is equivalent to his convexity, yeah, by the way, or of this function on the space of this self-adjoint positive matrices by, by Lanford and, and Robinson. And then they conjectured the results of more, more general version when there are overlaps. And then it was proven Lee Broska in 73. And, uh, and then in two, 2013, 
there was a meeting dedicated to, to uh, for 40 years of this entropy. Yeah. And and there was a, 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 a meanwhile, there the accumulated many proofs. There was kind of big problem, and it's all because fundamental for justifying kind of limits in 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 in, in such quantum physical mechanics. Because in subadditive, you know, then there are these limits when you exhaust space and become bigger and bigger, so things converge. And the, the all proofs, which and there were many proofs, but they were used on kind of some tricky. Inequalities, uh, because we were appealing to some relative entropy, which meaning physical, yeah, I never understood. Kind of strange formulas, which is right, mysterious to me what it means. And proving this relative entropy has some convexity. And secondly, they're using some operator type inequalities, which kind of tricky, interesting thing that many classical inequality, like Gölder inequality, Kashishworth's uh, inequality, they have the operator type version. If you write them properly, because you work in non non-commutative non word, you have to write formulas with the right order. And they're all tricky inequalities and all proofs beyond kind of my education. But however, if you repeat these physical words, as I said, you can make proof which just without anything, except for one little thing which you use, to which I return and which will be in the center of the what I'm going if you use the wild interpretation of the spectrum of a, of a self-adjoint matrix. And so how you, you think about that? Well, you, we have self-adjoint operator, you take a corresponding quadratic form. Now you have quadratic form as a function on the sphere, and you look at the level of this, and you see this picture, yeah? kind of familiar, kind of more picture, there's one critical point, and there's a saddle point, then the next point, next point, and the value there exactly the eigenvalues. And so you move, 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 but you have to interpret topologically. You have infinite dimensional projective space. You look at the level of the function. You start with a point. Then you absorb first cycle. It will be actually a circle, a projective line. Then you, you absorb next cycle, projective plane, etc. And this is the picture. Once you have this picture, plus this verse, I say, the number of states that are, and then proof follows without any computation, just by, 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 by going to the limit. And uh, no matter how long I spoke to the physics, I couldn't convince them. They, uh, any time, oh yeah, you probably use this identity, or you use this identity. They cannot accept the fact, it's a trivial fact. Once you take this very naive physical point of view, and this kind of very simple fact, it's a it, tautology. It's just that it follows from Shannon's theorem. The same way as I uh, wrote down this linearized, linearized uh, lumis whitney inequality. You just, when, in, when you go to the limit, it's a little bit looks like limit in, in tropical, tropical, tropical yeah, geometry. When you, or what, or, or what happens, more or less the same mechanism which happens in the large deviation, yeah. You go to something and then by Bernoulli theorem, you look at the maximum and all these things, the picture projects to the much simpler one when everything becomes obvious. And so, but however, it, the, the one the kind of tricky point there, if to do it really in two lines, which I don't want to do it, you have to use non-standard analysis because you, you repeat some experiment many times. So make it infinitely many times. And then you have to manipulate with infinitesimals, but because I don't know this analysis to, to be sure. So I check the epsilon delta, and this of course unpleasant. But if you accept kind of this infinite lim limit, which is in this case, you can check it works perfectly, and of course follow from the general principle of this analysis, it's just nothing. It, it reduces to Exactly. One, if one set contains another set, it, it's, it's, it's big. And here, if you have, you know, something, every topological space, a projective space and subspace, and there is retraction, rank of homology goes down or up or something on this level, this level of mathematics used. However, this operator inequality is quite amazing stuff, yeah, which I learned on the way and just well, a little bit about them. So this is what happens. And now, I want to change completely my, my um, perspective and not completely go away from the real world in a way, but just try to fantasize on, on the basis of mathematical theorems which we have and what can, what structures behave similar to probability and have more, more mathematical kind of essence to them. Yeah, because probability yeah, you, 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 I think roughly in the following terms. The probability is a function from some category of some physical, real world events to the very simple category of 
uh, real numbers or segments on the real line, something very primitive category where you go. And now you want to something which is have more structure, and particularly you want to use symmetry in a more profound way. In procedural mechanics, all you do with symmetry is to take identical particle, pop, you divide by, by a permutation group, and for some reason, actually I never quite understood, it's, uh, you get the right numbers. Why you have to kind of, uh, and then there's n factorial, and certainly formulas change. Yeah? They do it routinely in statistical mechanics, as if it's just the only thing to do, but it's not clear. I, I remember I never understood it, but I even forgot what I didn't understand. But now, in, in, in when you do it in, in geometry, there is more than that. And so, the problem we shall consider is the following. So, we start with the simplest, kind of the most classical physical picture. We have moving balls and hit each other and just something happened to them and they look at the measures of what happens. And so what physicist does, it observes what he can observe, say so take some region in space and see probability or in entropy what happens. And, and so the, the entropy is the number of states, visible states. But just as, but what is states? It's just it's some kind of points. Something happens not. But if you take the topological point of view, you say, well, what's points? Points zero dimensional homology. What about high dimensional homology? Or cohomology, or K theory. So you have now these particles moving, but what you want to understand, what happens to topology of the space when you look at from point point of view or restrict it in some sense. And so so, so so what is topology of the space? So the simplest question would be as follows. So uh, that you have these points moving in, in, in some ambient space, and the ball eventually becomes infinite. And then between points, there are these distances. And out of these distances, you make some energy. And, and the easiest ball will be 1 divided by minimal energy. So the closer they come, the stronger they interact. And so you have this kind of picture, this function. You look at sublevel and ask what is the topology of the space. And this space of configuration of points is very, very rich in topology. First, it acted upon by permutation group. Therefore, all the kind of homology of symmetric groups are there. So the space is mapped, say, if we have finitely many points, so the space is mapped to classifying space of the of the permutation group, and this has huge homology. And the question is, what of this you can see when you restrict this radius? So, and this is a kind of problem, and I don't know much about it, but I say what little is known. And so what was motivating that? And of course, if you take balls, but who said maybe balls, maybe other shapes moving, and then you have, you can see something else. And I say other shape, not accidentally, because in this picture of my cell, when you have this bilayer of molecules, it, it, this, these are not balls, but these rods, so they're kind of cylinders. And they, and you can say, the, this thing emerges not because of statistics, but because of topology. Why would the shape come in, into, into light? Because it's, it is, a, by argument, like fixed point theorem. Some, some cycles intersect, and then this picture emerges. So let me explain this. So, so what, what, what we can do in, in this respect? What's known in this respect? So first, in absolute, Covering this classical problem, and was in dimension two solved by Lagrange, the optimal density is packing of the plane is by hexagonal lattice, and then corresponding picture in dimension three was done by Thomas Hales, which is was solution of the Kepler problem that required lots of computation. I never understood it, but admit the logic how you reduce the computational problem. Of course. You need some computation. And then amazingly, it was solved in dimension 8 and 24, when the, again, op optimal solution are periodic. And because there are some particularly beautiful, beautiful um, lattices, but you don't expect anything like that in high dimensions. So you just, uh, I, or because you know that the optimal, in a way, packing, in a way, in a different way. So here, optimal meaning covering, covering, covering. <coughs> 
most volume. They're not only periodic, but they're, they're coming from root systems of, of some Lie groups. But in general, it is not true. If you go to higher dimension, look at periodic ones, and you consider not covering optimal volume, but being optimal in the sense of diameter. So you think about them as a, you have a lattice, in the quotient you have a torus, and then you compare not volume of the torus to the minimal ball, to the maximal ball contained there, but to the di diameter of the torus. So you just ask this question. What is it if you have high dimensional torus, and then there is this radius of the, what is it, what? Geometers call injectivity radius on one hand, and there is diameter on the other hand, and you want to this to be large of all lattices. So what you expect of this when dimension goes to infinity? And if you take a, a, a rectangular lattice, this will be one over square root of n. Da, right? And this is again by Pythagorean theorem, of course. And if you take any root system, it will be more or less the same. It will be, it will, it will be, uh, so the diameter grows like square root. But if you take random torus, it will be bounded. And it was observed by Burgen, Jan Burgen, that it's bounded. It's too bad about two or three or something. So, in, 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 so for this problem, there isn't a chance for it. But, but the point what I, I want to make is as follows here. And these people who studied that, they upset. They specifically say it. I, just, I, I looked in this one of the articles of this co-authors of this 24 theorem, that there is no simple relation between this optimal covering for dimension n and dimension n plus n. They just, they just do dimension, don't talk to each other, right? There are kind of trivial relations, of course, but there is nothing non-trivial. However, if you now introduce parameters, they do interact uh, for, the following, for the following reason, kind of trivial topological reason, in a, in a way trivial, in a way not, that if, just take it in a compact form, just to, to, to make it more, more pronounced, to, to say it easier to say, if you have x, some manifold x, and you see how many balls you can cover it, and then you take this x times, for example, say circle. And circle will be very long, yeah. Big circle. And so what, how is this covering correlated? There is no direct relation, but if in this space, instead of, instead of just looking at the looking at the covering, you look at the following cycle in the space of, of these points. When each point goes around the circle, so you take product, you, 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 can, you, you can see that so many particles as you want to use for covering and, and move with each of them over the circle, and so there is a cycle in the space of this embedding, which will be this torus. So you have n particle, there is a torical cycle, and, and, and then it, it, we see in which level the cycle appears. So as I said, we change your radius and see when it appears. And it appears exactly at the same moment when there is a packing of the space by axis. Because you know, if you have, this, of course, on one hand, if there are balls covering there, you can move them, each of them independently of this cycle. On the other hand, by, if you have anything here, and there is moving ball, they necessarily fit at some moment, they intersect uh, at the right moment this thing there, and there will be this covering there, so you cannot move them more efficiently. Yeah, it's elementary exercise, and you see the kind of so catapology of things intersect, and so something being realized. So they do talk to each other. So we can say, aha, uh -huh, given any of this covering theorem, there is carbonic parametric theorem. But if there is such and such space, so what happens? And how far you can go with this? And so there are two points. One, corresponding to my cells, but where you can prove something topologically, which is rather geometric. So, where this thing, eraser, might be here. Yes. So we, uh, I'll move it and Okay, I, I, I would be a study with a good theorem. There are, there are two kind of theorems which are stated there. 
which are both proven topologically, though they are both geometric. And the first one, again, I formulated because amusingly enough, it's not fully solved. So I have a sphere of dimension n, and I have here Euclidean space of dimension m. It's lying in the space of three dimensions, n plus 1. And here there is a continuous map. And we took the pullback of the points, and so it becomes kind of, look at these pullbacks. First we formulate a conjecture, and then instead a theorem, because it's amazing this conjecture is unsolved. And then the, you look, so you look at the levels of the points here, points from here, and look at the volume of dimension naturally, n minus m, meaning Hausdorff measure. And you believe that there is an x such that this will be greater than the volume of the sphere of dimension n minus m. So the external configuration, of course, be linear projection. So always there is a point pulled back of which as big as it would be for linear projection. And volume meaning Hausdorff measure. Here is a point point. If you say Minkowski volume is proven, and this is a version of Arnold's theorem, and even more than that you can say. But for Hausdorff measure, it's still unknown. And the fact there is a bound, even the fact there is non trivial bound for Hausdorff measure, is a rather unpleasant argument. You have to use some combinatorics, and, and there is no kind of straightforward argument. No, and this house, of, and you see the map may be smooth, whatever. So you see this pullback may be very ugly, and there is kind of strange, kind of, and it's kind of clear the more ugly the word the, the, the said, the stronger must be inequality, but I just couldn't prove it. And, it, and the, none of the methods, there are two methods actually to prove it one geometric measure theory, going back to Angren, and the, with one is another is topological, and the topological one exactly, as I said, you, you, you can show because of topology. When there, there are this family of these subsets, and you see how they intersect, with, you can see the family of, of sets meeting them and filling the space. And you can show that topology is such, they meet together in, in, in a certain way, and the space becomes filled by this kind of convex subsets, and then you see how measures and volume are related, and you get this inequality. And the key is a, is a kind of a Ulumborso kind of theorem, it's rather simple, simple computational homology. Though again, it doesn't give you a full picture of the space, and it may be worth mentioning the, the space involved is space of convex partitions of the sphere. And the space of convex partitions of the sphere, convex, and certainly very much adapted to the, this particular geometry, it has very interesting topology. And the, the reason why topology comes, which is because I, in, looking in this picture, so this symmetry which brings in that each of those molecules you can switch the symmetry. Actually, it's not quite true, maybe not always in, in biology, but here you can switch. And so you can switch each of them. So you have product of two groups of order two, and they are classifying space as a product of projection space, and this product of projection space, well, it just has some substance, topological substance, which then influences geometry. So that's kind of already how symmetry works here. But there is no proof of that by statistical mechanics, and which probably still must be con con combined with topology anyway. No, and, 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 and with more technical question, amazingly enough, is open. And it is often overlooked that this is a tricky point. So it's one point. And another more interesting one, which is closer to what we want to look, is a Larry Goose theorem which I formulate and must when we make little interruption. It's first I formulate in a very simple form, and then say more words with it. And this concerns space of cycles in the, say, the sphere in the ball, which is the same. So I have sphere of dimension n, and we can see the k-dimensional cycles. And his cycle will be mod 2 cycles. And this mod 2 because mod 2 because we don't know what happens for other modeling. 
So we have the space of cycles. And one knows what the space is. This is just k, if I'm not mistaken, m minus n, this classifying space. Of the classifying, the shifted classifying space of the of the group, so Allenberg maclean space. Allenberg maclean space of this group. The space of cycles is Allenberg maclean space. This is basically a pure algebra, right? Given any kind of chain complex, you can define out of this, this semi simplicial space of cycles, and then out of each homology, give you this kind of space. And here is the only homology for the, the two. There are zero cycles, and there are funda this fundamental class, and this fundamental class in the sphere. Uh, give you this classifying space with shoot by two. That's kind of uh, this Tom Dalt theorem, I guess. In, in so it's uh, easy, easy, easy topology, but kind of essential here. So we have the space. So we have big space, complicated space. If it's co-dimension one, it's just projective space. It's easy, right? If you have co-dimension one cycles, it's easy space, projective space. And for this space, we understood it earlier. But then, and but this space is tricky. It's actually a standard algebra, right? It's, or, or for Z2. It's just free model or, or rank one of a standard algebra. So it's kind of a rank of this grows, grows, grows like a branch in a tricky way. And then on this space, we can see that it's a function, and the function is volume. What is the volume? It's n minus m dimensional volume. Well, I'm sorry, n minus k dimensional, k dimensional volume of the cycle. In, in, in earlier in language, it was minus m. m is co-dimension. So consider volume. We don't care now what like, you think the cycle piecewise smooth, so I don't care about to think about how the measure. It's just purely technicality. I just brought it up because it's kind of kind of strange thing. There is trivial technicality, which, however, makes things harder. It just should, should, should be cleaned up. It's just dirt we have to throw away. But this is everything is clean. No, no technicalities. And we want to know how it behaves, how homology behaves. So we, we, we have this uh, standard algebra, and we have this subset. And so what you do from all standard algebra cohomology reduced to the subset. So we have ideal in the standard algebra. So we have family of ideals, and some moment, ideals change. Yeah? When you go above, the ideal become smaller and smaller, right? Because you be, be restrict to a bigger and bigger sets. So how they behave? So, so I have the sequence of this. And, uh, and Lari has formulated precise moments when this happens up to a constant, because there is Riemannian geometry, but this only changes the constant. And one of the outcomes that this behave polynomially, namely, in order to, ups to come to dimension g, your volume must be some g or some power alpha, and this comes characteristic alpha. So just state only that. And there is no, for all I know, no direct proof of, by, by geometrically without appeal to the structure of the standard algebra. So I have to look particularly what term and you know, what is element there in this canonical basis, and you can say what happens to it. And there is no way to do it elementary. And just for me, it was a great surprise. When I saw the theorem first, I said, oh, at least this outcome must be obvious. And then I couldn't do it. Maybe I couldn't do it, but nobody so far can do it. How to see it geometrically, that you cannot realize things to, to, to by smaller cycles in degree d. Right? In, in one direction, realization is easy. Right? You can. But why you cannot do better? Why it might be polynomial, but not exponential? Or you double. You, what, what you can you, you prove, I think exponential you can prove elementary, that there is some bound exponential kind. It's very easy for co-dimension one. You just topology involved is just Ulum Borsuk theorem, which you use in some elementary, elementary kind of isoperimetric inequality. But here it's strangely enough unknown, and there is a theorem. It's still alpha is not perfect in a way there is epsilon. You only can prove it with arbitrary small epsilon, so it's the sharp inequality is still unknown. In the second they say so what we actually want of that. So this when the space of, these of uh, cycles at the homology degree d, that's uh, yeah. Uh, uh, what is what if you consider the cycles of the of, of a given volume, what uh, the degree you can achieve you know, in this homology space, and so they're related by by, 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 by this power law. 
And there is a, this easily computable number, if you know, you can easily guess what the number is. But, and, but, but well, there is, there is epsilon still missing, and this is not done for higher, for, for mod 3, for example. Because this, again, there is this, of course, st standard algebra, but it doesn't have geometric interpretation. Because for mod 2, standard algebra has very simple geometric interpretation, but not m m mod 3. And and, 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 and for integer homologies, it's certainly quite complicated. Now, so what you I ideally you want to have. So one remarkable thing here is that if you look at the codimension one problem, which is all equivalent of Laplace operator or whatever, op a simple operator, and you have this picture, when you, the only symmetry involved is you consider a function f function minus f function. So it's in evolution, this evolution, Classifying space is projective space, and so your eigenvalues are indexed by integers, which are ideals in this poly polynomial algebra of a, of, a, of, a, of a field. But here, in this picture of Larry, eigenvalues are indexed by ideals in the singlet algebra. And that is, I think, a kind of remarkable, interesting picture and must have much more, much more uh, situation when this arises and should be should should be un understood and we don't know and, and the question which uh, unsolved still what is the asymptotic of that but now it's not asymptotic on one parameter asymptotic on the branching tree branching tree of student algebra so and this I guess has uh, something to do with probability as well as I was mentioning there are these trees of different nature trees which you see in, in, in linguistics and this is another kind of tree when you but this is unclear what it has to do with probability so far. So, so far the only link with probability was in this my cell picture. When I, it actually emerges probabilistically, you warm your solution and this molecules run away. You, you can, you, it goes cooler and they condense to the shape. And the reason of condensation is kind of statistical, physical. But you can interpret it ma mathematically in the following way that there is but futures, future surface and there are these sticks floating around and because of topology they all fit there because when individually they go back and forth topology for them go there but if that higher codimension is tricky so what happens the shape becomes more complicated the convex sets of a more complicated shape and this there is not this kind of a next step like in the lyric goose so this concerns only the bottom of the spectrum you just Kind of the first the zero kind of cycle in this, in this complicated standard algebra, and for high you have to do something else. And this we shall ex I explain after the interruption how you go and, and how it brings forth a, the idea of homological probability. So now we make 10 minutes break. Yeah. And I want to say how we prove that, what is it, how it's related to the space of balls. Maybe prior to that, let me say just, just one word, some other application of the spectrum, which is well, well understood now in codimension one and still problematic. And, and there is <coughs> the Weil law. So Herman Weil law. I was confused how you write Weil, yeah? And uh, that, so one of them I mentioned, there is topological interpretation of the spectrum. It's just how the homology of project space grow when you have this quadratic function. And secondly, what happens at the limit? What is the limit of that asymptotically when i goes to infinity? Of course, it goes because uh, some power of dimension, something n over 2. And uh, I, I'm sorry, it's i to the g over 2. Or, or, or whatever, yeah, but uh, so, and so this theorem tells you, the good theorem tells you in which interval it goes, at least uh, with some little error, conjectural, but if there is a limit, and so the fundamental property of, of the spectrum, 
which uh, corresponding to smoothness of the structure of the space, there is a limit. So you know what is, well, there is a limit in that. So the eigenvalues, if you properly normalize them, they converge to some limit. So, so or, or better to say, the number of eigenvalues below a certain limit can, uh, grows, and so the, it's, it's the same like packing, actually. The, the, you, you kind of pa pack it by little balls, and you take spectrum of each ball, and they're additive. So this, this thing is kind of behave like a measure. It's proportional to the volume of the manifold. So very high frequencies, they correspond to localized eigenvalues and uh, correspond to covering by balls. And this is a while. And this was eventually proven uh, recently by, and sorry, because I may not say words, uh, not to be, to be sure of my pronunciation of names correct, of people involved. Uh, where the hell is this? Yeah. Oh, why disappeared? It was an, an uh, Neves, Marcus, and Selikimovich, I believe, who proved this in dimension. F f in co-dimension one cycles, that there is a limit. So how this eigenvalues, they can uh, the, uh, properly normalized, they, they have this limit similar to the similar to the Weyl theorem, and also corresponding kind of packing of obvious space. You cover by little balls, and what happens in each of them happened there. In this picture, we shall see that the proof of that as refinement uh, in the special case of this uh, argument used use in Lyrie's theorem, which corresponds to the space of balls. So here, just individual covering by balls being involved, but the constant, by the way, is unknown. There's some universal constant corresponding to it. So the, so, so the volume, of, and this was kind of, kind of a remarkable corollaries, unexpected corollaries, as the amazing corollaries, that he can prove that by that, that in high dimension, no manifolds, from dimension three on, minimal cycles are kind of uniformly distributed. You have a sphere with any geometry, and look at this mi minimal hypersurfaces, which corresponds exactly to this uh, coming from the spectrum, and they will be uniformly distributed in the, on, on the manifold. I've forgotten exactly who proved that. And exactly, and, and the point is this wild picture applied to other ge geometric quantities, and this simplest form, but simplest but the sharpened form of this coupling of Larry Goose, which I'm going now to explain. So, I have a space, a sphere or ball. And there are two objects there. On one hand, we have a space of cycles of some dimension. So, so what is the space of cycles? For example, the simplest example, we are already non-trivial. I mean, no, it's non-trivial for all dimensions, but the, the power of theorem visible with the goose uh, thin algebra enters for the first time. There will be one cycle in this one cycle in S3, or, or the ball. It's more or less the same, yeah. Yes where the cycle is absolute or, or relative. So it's, it's circles, curves in the ball. But when I say they are cycles, so you can be, you can, you can have singularity. And what is a family, what topology is there? And in, in principle, what is a family of cycles? You don't know what topology is, you don't care. You want to know what is a k-dimensional, one-dimensional family of cycles. And, and, and say one-dimensional family of one dimensional cycle is two dimensional cycle, sliced by these one dimensional cycles. Right? And this, par this parameter space will be cycle in the space of cycles. Right? So, curve there, or cycles from this language is the same. So, cycles in the space of cycles is a sliced high dimensional cycles. And this, or this of course, is easy to understand by a lower dimension. When the dimension getting bigger, it becomes not so easy to describe geometrically. But this must be described more carefully, either in this way or purely algebraically. As I said, space of concept of space of cycle make sense for any chain complex, given algebraic chain complex of, of any module or work of a billion groups. Out of this, you can space space of cycles. You know what cycles are, 
but you can say space of cycles, yeah, in, in, uh, translating this to al algebraic terms. And, and, and then all this kind of theorem becomes tautological linear algebra, trivial excess. But what is not, but this pairing is not quite, quite simple, obvious, and another easier space of balls or points in your space. So they have points which move around, but you think about these tiny little balls. Eventually, they, we, we have to look at the distance between these points. And then the coupling is as follows, that at some moment these two spaces interact. And they interact in a very simple way, that you have the space family of moving cycles and family of moving points, and, and it takes cycle here and cycle there, they may intersect. Right? This intersection is space of cycles, meaning when we move these points, they may all simultaneously end up here. So, so what happens that which you can interpret in two ways, right? I, 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 I prefer it, it's just, I, I just describe one particular picture which is the most geometric, yeah? Where this coupling takes place. And I prefer this thing as little tiny balls. So I have a ball. And inside, they have little balls moving. So we have space with these moving balls. And some cycle may be in the space of moving balls. Cycle meaning a uh, homology class represented by a cycle. But I really want to be in cycle. On the other hand, I have in big space also some cycle moving. So it's, high, it's high parametric family of cycles. So I'm going to intersect that in each of these balls, I will have also cycle moving, but certainly will be lower dimensional. Yeah? But the depending on the law, it depends on the dimension of this two. We can figure out what will be there. So my coupling in this space goes from the space of cycles to the product of space of cycles, all those, but of lower dimension. And so you gain quite a bit because when you go to the high, to the high dimensional cycle, there it is just high term distended algebra. And, and here you can reduce to the case when it will be just. And this ball will be just lowest dimensional, just corresponding to slicing of the ball. So, so, the, so, so there is this coupling from product. So you, you take cycle homology in the space of cycle, take homology in, in the space of moving balls, and you end up in the product of, of space of cycles in each individual ball. But you shift dimension in a certain way, which makes it really quite, quite useful. And how you use it in a geometric way. So you, you want to show that if you have complicated high dimensional cycle in the space of cycles, some member of this must have large dimension, large, large volume, right? That's the major kind of one, kind of one half of the theorem of, of Larry, the most kind of interesting, more, more, more difficult, less obvious part. So the, the geometric problem, I repeat, is as follows. You have a family of cycles, of, 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 of circles, of one-dimensional cycle in the ball. But it's high-dimensional cycle, the dimension billion. So, and you want to show that the volume of this at some moment might become so it's, uh, bound from below. They cannot be all small. So what you do? You create some cycle, in, 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 uh, and you have to show it exists. There is some cycle in the space of moving balls, such that necessarily, by topology, all this ball at some moment will have centers in your cycle. And then, because there is a ball of certain size, the volume of your cycle is bounded by below, well, roughly by the number of this volumes times the, the radio of this, uh, radio of this ball. And this is, a, but you have to create, construct that, and this construct in rather ingenious way, where it's topological kind of problem. Partly, partly geometric, because first you, you show that there is a cycle algebraically, forgetting this ball just for, for points, and then it can be implemented by moving balls with certain size. Right? So, in order to prove something impossible here, right, in the space of cycles or, or, or in, in the manifold, you, you, you do by duality that something you construct effectively in the, in the other side. And this is, of course, a powerful way. To, to prove something doesn't exist, this kind of duality shows 
something dual must exist. So it's like Poincaré duality, of course. And this Poincaré type duality, but now with geometric flavor to that. But this and still and, and, uh, has some little gap epsilon. Uh, it's kind of some the constant involved. For each epsilon, there is a constant in this exponent, d plus minus epsilon. So not perfect. And, 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 and still, and of course, it's unknown what happens in the limit, if the limit actually exists in some conceivable, p p correct way. So that's, that's the, the, the point. Now, from this moment on, just this is my kind of motivation. So what is else I can say before I come to the homology measures? Mm. Yeah, maybe yes. You know, I can pass to to that. Yes, I, I, what I what I was saying there. It's prior to what I what I was saying. It's a, you know, so for, for formalism, I want to indicate, I want to uh, 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 the following question. Uh, in fact, think about this moving ball in the following way. S so starting from manifold, you create a new space, the space of balls moving in there. So, of course, topologically, you just take kind of space of disjoint point in the space to get the permutation group acting there. It's kind of this G manifold. And then, and, 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 and so this is purely topological object. But then you have this function filtration of space, depending which of those homology or cohomology or maybe K-theory, I don't know what, topology, homotopy type generally understood, Im implemented when you allow these points to be surrounded by balls, and this ball shouldn't intersect. Right? So we have this topological space for each n. And the kind of filtration, and I'm, I'm interested when the ball becomes smaller and smaller, and the number getting bigger and bigger. So I have two parametric asymptotics. Epsilon goes to zero, number goes to infinity, and there are many ranges can, can go. And for each of this range, there is topological behavior. So I have kind of family of topological spaces parameterized by that. By two parameters, one integer parameter, number of points, and one real parameter. So I have this. Some topology, homology, some linear algebra, and here is number of points, and here is epsilon. And they organize, they have kind of nature, na naturality about them. The question is, in what way in, is it, does it re reconstruct a manifold? So I have a Riemannian manifold X, and it has metric, tra -tra -tra, and then you associate to this something in a way more primitive. It's just topological, family of topological spaces. And so, uh, real number enters only within epsilon. It's look kind of purely combinatorial object except for this epsilon. And something you can reconstruct, and something not. So here is, uh, you can reconstruct probably, if you look closer in this argument, of light, you can reconstruct areas, volumes of, 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 of certain minimal cycles. However, I w and the easy case when you can do it, is if we have a manifold, say, of non-positive curvature, and you look at the lengths of the geodesics, they are reconstructable. It's easy to show. But if you look, for example, a sphere, and you look at the equators, it's unclear to me if you can reconstruct those from, from this in general. Yeah. So it depends on the geometry, it depends on the topology. So it's unclear to me how much the space, uh, how much information it carries. And if it has independent uh, kind of structure of its own, and this is a reminiscent maxim, what you mentioned to me that you can how you can represent a Riemannian manifold by a functor from category of graph to category of measure spaces, right? That if you have a if you have a Riemannian manifold, you can see the maps of a graph with a length assigned into the space and has a Wiener measure. And, and when you have a sub subgraphs, you have a map from one another, which have some prescribed measure behavior. And all this ensemble probably reconstructs the Riemannian manifold. But regardless of that, it's an interesting object in its own right, and you can kind of it, it, it absorb much of the uh, analysis and green formulas for, 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 for Laplacian, Laplacian on manifold, and it kind of 
the same thing. Maybe interesting for other operators, especially for Dirac operator, when you have to introduce more to that. And this is another kind of a way to think about manifold. The idea you decompose your manifold into pieces and look pieces separately. And you don't know how they glued together exactly, but you know how they can move with respect to each other. And so I think it's an interesting thing, especially if you allow not only balls but other shapes. And parallel question, which may have more substance to that, when you have symplectic manifold and you look they balls, but balls are symplectic balls. And you, you, you ask the same question. How much of the stru symplectic structure can be seen in that? When you have tiny little balls and they move, then what is the topology? And you can add something maybe to the, the distortion being involved, extra parameter. So which, which may have some kind of physical interpretation because you see your space on the piecemeal. You don't know how it glued together. But for some fantastic reason, you know the topology of, this, of the whole space. OK, but now, so this was motivation. And now we come to homology measure. So example, just to have in mind, is generalization of what I said, interpretation of the Morse spectrum. When you have this function, you take pullbacks of a point. But now what we have. We have a background space, kind of in physical terms, the space of observable, and then kind of space over x, and this is space of observable, say O, and there is a map here. And so what you observe, kind of in, uh, for, for example, in, in physical situation, you have space of particles moving in this space, or, or, or particle not moving but being in many states, and then you count what you see in different open subsets. So for each open subset, you see the number of ob ob observable and the are all these inequalities. But now what you, what you do, you see topology of the space. So you have a space, you have this space U, and this is a map F, and you take F minus 1 of U, it sits inside of this X, and instead of assigning to its entropy, which is the number of states, which is, of course, very close to the measure, in spirit, you look at what is topology of that which part of the, say, homology of space this absorbs. How to say it properly? What you do, you look at the complement of this set. So you have this u. You take this complement minus u is better. Take that and take homomorphism from cohomology of the big space to this set. And this gives you the size of the measure of the size of u. And this has formal property of the measure. And it is, property is uh, subadditivity. Because what you assign is ideal in this cohomology ring. Right? It's not a set, it's ideal. So or, or linear subspace, if, if you forget about multiplicative structure. So to each open, say, set, you assign, assign a, a linear subspace in some cohomology algebra. And it is, sub, it is additive as a measure. So, oh. it's, it's not like elementary, of course, uh, linear algebra. So two just join set, and then the subset just adds up as linear subsets. And the extra bonuses, it's also well behaved with respect to cup product. It's sub, sub additive. And, and so this is a, this is a kind of <coughs> structure. And the question is, which I don't quite, quite know, what you can do with that. Except that in the example which we have, it was just one dimensional, but it may have several observables, and there are many examples when it appears. And so, so I want to say what I want to say about this or more. All right, and then there is this when we have this infinite dimensional space, then the, the relevant counterpart to the entropy 
is the Poincaré polynomial of the space and the CD polynomial. And when you go to the limit, you, you may not converge in the particular point of this polynomial, but still it may converge somewhere. And you have this rather, rather, rather interesting invariant, which is computable for many function spaces, because, they, because interesting function spaces, they have highly non-trivial product structure. Right, that's the point. So what I you can see? And so what you can do with this next? So granted that, so you may go next and can create interesting invariant on, of, of various classes of spaces. So, so in something you do know, some of them are symplectic manifolds. So for Riemannian manifolds, you have this kind of structure in the space of, say, moving balls, or structure in the space of moving cycles. Now, if you consider some class of Riemannian, for example, you consider symplectic spaces, or you consider a particular class of Riemannian manifolds. You can do the same, you can do the same, but then you, you need to choose a Riemannian metric adapted, adapted to your problem. Say, in symplectic structure, you take this quasi-Killerian matrix. So Riemannian metric adapted to a symplectic one. You do this for, your, for cycles and see you have the spectrum. And then you take, I always forget, supremum and infimum of all metrics. Yeah. In, in one sense, you have nothing, and, and otherwise you have constraints. In, in Riemannian geometry, the proper class of object will be matrix with the lower bound on the scaly curvature. Say so positive scaly curvature is bounded from below. And you do the same because there are non-trivial constraints even if you go to the old matrix below or above, the, 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 with, with curvature below or above this level. So you, of course, I'm sorry, curvature always must be more positive than say plus one, but the invariant, the, so, so the point is that you cannot have then two big cycles. The cycles must be in some sense small. Some of them must be small. But you don't know, again, we have examples, when the indication to, towards what I say, but we, we, we don't know how much we reconstruct in this way. For example, for symplectic geometry, if this fully reconstruct, uh, uh, classifies symplectic manifolds, right? Or if this invariance, uh, you can show the invariance non-trivial, but you prove it by standard techniques of symplectic geometry. You don't do anything kind of new. Yeah, you use standard invariance. But however, a priori, you get new invariants of manifolds. A priori, they are new. They are not covered by old ones. But the only cases when you can show they are non-trivial invariants when you then reducible to classical invariants. Now, so what else I wanted to say? Okay, just maybe I, I just f formulate some theorems. Just uh, explaining what I meant, yeah? Except for, for scale recovery, because this uh, subject matter I was thinking most recently. There is the following very pretty theorem in, in the spirit of what I'm saying concerning metric with positive scale recovery. If you have a sphere, I just case state that the case where it's known. It's uh, un unknown in, in this sharpening for the general th three manifolds, for high dimensional manifolds. You have three dimensional sphere, uh, and you have a Riemannian metric on this, such that scaly curvature of this metric is greater or equal than scaly curvature of the sphere, and this is six, yeah? you know, usual normalization. Scaly curvature is sum of all principal curvatures. So consider such a metric, but one knows the space may be, this metric may be tricky. Yeah? Manifold may look like that, it may have like that, it may spread in all directions, may have arbitrary large volume, diameter, etc. However, so what is known in this theorem of Marcus and Nerves, though they formulated kind of key lemma which implies what I'm saying, is that so just to have an idea you may like how it looks like. You may have sphere, and it can, can, can they connect with some with another sphere. And here is another sphere, or makes have this kind of this narrow things. However, 
he can construct two dimensional sphere which moves around and slice it along. So assuming the scaly curvature is greater than that, yeah? You can take two dimensional which goes around and slices by two dimensional spheres, when area of all slices will be always less or equal than four pi. So exactly like you run round sphere sliced by these parallel sections. And this is unknown for high dimensions. It's not even known for three manifolds which are not topological spheres. If they're not topological spheres, there is an estimate which is non sharp, which is some kind of maybe. Then four pi it will be 100 pi or something. something uh, no, not, not, not interesting. And, and this is kind of, kind of quite a, uh, amusing example of that, yeah? That metric, once you have positive scalar curvature, metric cannot become too big. And the same for symplectic geometry. Once you have symplectic geometry, and you can see the uh, Riemannian, adapt to Riemannian metric, metric cannot be too big. You can slice, if you have symplectic manifold like also ball with the usual symplectic structure, take any metric adapted to that, you also can slice it for small two-dimensional, for small two-dimensional surfaces where areas will be in this case at least two pi. So the same kind of phenomenon you see for positive scaly coefficient for symplectic manifold and we don't quite understand that. And in, in this case, you can look at this goose type duality and see what happens with the packing of com complementary balls. And here such picture also exists, but it's become rather tricky what, a, what a this ball and what this covering means. But certainly the enter here. But this is, you see, it's low, lower dimensional cycles. You don't use high dimensional homology in this measure, in this example, because they, of course, this needs to, to invent more sophisticated theorems, which we don't have. So what else I wanted to say? Okay, well, more or less, I finished. So, more or less, I finished, and then I would rather answer your questions. So, because you see, so the, 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 the final outcome is not quite satisfactory. On one hand, you have this ma 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 reasonable concept of homology valued measure. When you have a or, or linear algebraic measure, you have a space, and to each open set, you assign subspaces and some given linear space, and it has got kind of additivity, multiplicativity, and also well behaved by the way of seeing that moduli with respect to scene operations, or probably case theoretically, it will behave nicely with respect to Adam's operations. So you have the structure which has formal additivity up to some point, and plus extra structure. And so the <coughs> general suggestion is when it, any time you have physical, pro, physical kind of, kind of physical ensemble, when you study entropically, you can do the same with this. You can start doing that because the basic properties are there. Sometimes you have subadditivity, entropy-like, so you can go to the thermodynamic limit in this homological sense, and this object will be this Poincaré polynomials. So entropy will be not a number, but now a polynomial. <coughs> and again, there are some examples where you can make this computation, because, but, but uh, certainly I haven't done that. Even for the case of moving balls, I must say my limitations start from the poor understanding of the homology of the symmetric group, or okay, case theory of symmetric group. So the answer will depend very much on this. So the symmetry enters now in a much more fundamental way, but my <coughs> I only can say it must be so, but I don't enough qualify to, to give examples when it is so. And <coughs> for example, this good duality must have more for example, how much of the homology of configuration space you construct from these uh, uh, cycles. This, this is a duality, or rather coupling, but there is no duality yet. There is a kind of bilinear form between the two, and, and, that's, that, and that's it. Yeah. We don't know this, uh, this isomorphism in any way. <coughs> if you can make isomorphism out of that. It's not impossible. Yeah. As properly said, one space will be uh, isomorphic to the dual of another space. So these are questions which, which bring forth. And all my kind of preliminary, all my lectures, we just look to show that there is something you may expect in this direction. And uh, so, 
and, and just well, just I, 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 I refer here to papers when I a little bit speak about that. And in, in particular, I think it may be quite interesting also look at percolation theory from, 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 from this perspective or, or other classical physical models using homology and see what happens. So you may expect nice modalities come from out of that, which probably has, will have no, will have no any applications, but just for the heck of this, you may look at this, yeah. But that's you know, all I had to say for that. <coughs> so you, you, you de definitely have problem asking questions because it was rather vague, but you may try, yeah? It's so, so what we like probability to take values in, a, in some ordered set? Do you want to say that probability is bigger than...? No, but they're not numbers, yeah? You see that the whole point in examples they, 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 one example when they are trees. So probabilities are trees. It, it's not the order. That we can compare them eventually. But they in, in linguistic, yeah. They, or, or biology, I think at least trees are there. Here, probabilities are linear subspaces or ideals in some algebra. Right? So, so the ordering is kind of unclear how essential it is. You see, it's partly what happened in quantum mechanics, which, so in quantum mechanics you use square root of numbers, right? Instead of a real numbers, you have a complex numbers, and this achieved by the, achieved by the momentum map, right? So the simplest such a map, when you map Cpn to the simplest, right? You take z by z bar. So there is this map, and the probability here measure here come from this measure, right? And here there is no order. And this is kind of the world of quantum mechanics. So amazingly, which I didn't say, it's one of the amazing things about probability, maybe I haven't m mentioned that. So in probability, you write this formula, sine pi log pi. Or you take log of the number of states. Why you take log? Why not just number of states? Then it will multi multiplicative instead of additive. And uh, somebody may say, and this is, I heard, I heard that, well, because addition is simpler than multiplication. Which, by the way, you know, it's unknown. It's conjecture. And conjecture, actually, maybe they're equally, it is how many operations you need to multiplication. When you multiply two numbers, de decimally, usual way, it takes square table. So it goes the square number of operations. Actually, it's a number, it will be, it's, it's n, digit will be n to the power 2 minus epsilon, there is some epsilon. This is the Karatsuba theorem. So you need square number operation, but it's unknown if you have linear number operation. So you don't know, actually, that in this sense, multiplication is easier than, than addition. Right? But then the, this answer reminds me of the following, which I heard when I was a boy. You ask an adult man, why most cars have this uh, uh, the drive on the be behind, not the front wheel, not the front wheel drive is not everywhere. It isn't closer to the engine one, you don't do it. And the answer here, oh, you know, because pushing is easier than pulling, right? Yeah, I remember the sunset, I was kind of, still remember it because I was shocked by EJC. Of course, I was probably a boy. Uh, I have formulated in these terms, yeah, as idiocy, strange answer. The same about that. Addition, mathematical multiplication, who is easier? However, there is a, some reason, and this is a highly non-obvious, and this is the Fisher theorem. And the Fisher theorem, which has many names, was already discovered by many people many times, and Fisher was, you know, a kind of statistician who mostly worked in mathematical biology. On, on, on exactly on dynamics of evolution or statistical mechanics evolution is as follows. If we have a function sum of pi log pi. So it's function the simplex, right? Simplex exactly because sum of pi positive number and sum pi equals to one. 
So it's a function in the simplex. Shannon inequality says the function is, I keep forgetting, convex or concave. It is with some sum. And therefore, if you take the Hessian of this function, because po po positive, this gives you a Riemannian metric, it's positive semi definite. So a simplex comes with a Riemannian metric. And so what the metric is? And, uh, and then there is Fisher's theorem saying that this metric of constant, is constant positive curvature. And you see it, you have a map from the sphere to the simplex, which is the real part of the moment map. And this gives you the seismometry. Computing the curvature, of course, who compute the curvature? Yeah? You'll die, at least. But, and there is a, oh, what well, I'm using kind of, if you look at this, I, I was, actually I was asking somebody, a person gave me, oh, it's called, you know, some name. And then they look at this name, and then there were many references, and eventually I came to Fisher. It's Fisher, Fisher was the first to, to write it, I think the first, to, 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 to make this observation. And it was then rediscovered at least seven times I found it. And people, and this was absolutely fantastic. So there is orthogonal symmetry in this formula. So quantum mechanics and the symmetrization, passing from real numbers, to, to, to uh, not unitary, but orthogonal symmetry, is in the, in the nature of this entropy, in the interplay of, of, of additive and multiplicative structure. So this kind of, and this of course brings forth many other way how we can think about probability, because this is just projective space or sphere, and this is moment map there, and positivity of the entropy can be now, and when you think interpreted, now in terms of geometry, topology, not of the projective space and the spectra, but the complex projective space, and then you can replace complex projective space by other algebraic varieties, and positivity there, and the positivity is intersectional cycle, basically, of complex uh, algebraic cycle is positive. Probably can be background for generalized probability theory, and this may be kind of one way to link what I'm saying, these homology measures and probability. So eventually, of course, you want them to be unified and have this theory and this one indication, something uh, unexpected happens here and entropy is, is, is playing some role. So, what? so this is about sign and sign disappears. In quantum mechanics, there is no sign. This is why it is irreal. Yeah, it's you know, imaginary number. So the world is imaginary, but from quantum mechanical point of view, our world, of course, is imaginary. Our world, of course, doesn't exist. I mean, the only, you know, the only the problem of collapse of quantum state, the only convincing explanation that our real world doesn't exist. There is no collapse, we are not here. We are just, you know, product of our own imagination. So, uh, so, so it's not, probably should not be positive, uh, uh, ultimately. But, but, but only when it becomes positive, you can use it and apply it to kind of say, statistical languages or physical systems. Yeah. It's paradoxical things like that. Yes. Yeah. Right. Oh, uh, just an observation. Um, Sorry again? Just an observation. Uh, yeah. You mentioned the equidistribution of minimal surfaces. I believe, I may be mistaken, but I believe that was by Antoine Song. I, I, about the infinitely many equidistribution. Uh, right, right, right. You're right, yeah. Right. Yes, I think it's the name, yeah. yeah. Who proved the infinitely many surfaces and proved the equidistribution. That's correct. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I have to correct myself. Uh, I was saying last time about Fred Hoyle, who pre predicted some particular <coughs> state, isotope of nitrogen, but uh, Thibault corrected me, it was actually about carbon. For some reason, I was, uh, I was confused. He looked at the whole chain of transformations, but it was what he uh, predicted was a, a state, kind of, it, it's a highly unstable isotope of carbon resonance, as they say. Yeah. My memory serves me well. The curl of the theorem is different. It says that multiplication essentially is easiest addition. should have something like n log n iterations. No, no, I think it's a, it's a, if you take a little multiplication, addition is linear. Yeah, and uh, multiplication. Multiplication at, at, at the so table a priori is quadratic. No, 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 no. I, I think it's linear as well. Yeah, no, it's a no. I mean, it's new. Karatsuba, I think, is just exponent still below quadratic. Yeah, 
And Logan, I think you're using fast Fourier. It's, it's it's followed with fast Fourier by log and Logan? Yeah, I think so. No, because it, I think in computers really have that, like ten thousand digits numbers. Multiplication is really easy because of. I think it's linear. I don't have smartphone this moment. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Yeah, I, we see maybe it it it, it meant. Exactly, in about algebra. We are first of all, Fourier is not quite algebra, no? It's still not transcendental, it's pure algebraic, yeah? yeah so. Okay, but this is my recollection, of course, yeah, yeah, I wouldn't insist. I wouldn't insist what I said. Yeah, I, I remember reading it somewhere and I could be mistaken, yeah. Of course, if you look at the name of Karatsuba and multiplication, you'll find it on the net. Karatsuba, I'm certain, was in, involved. Yes, yes, yeah, it's okay, it's maybe that. Maybe with Logan, uh huh. But linear is unknown. Yeah, it's a non of linear. That's maybe we agree on that. Yeah? <laughs> it may be linear, which is unlikely. Okay, well, I don't know. I don't want to make conjecture, of course, not my business. It's not my field. Yeah, I don't make conjecture. It's hard to imagine a spin of linear, which is not a good argument. Okay, no questions. Everything is clear. Bravo. <laughs>